evening. So I thought um, while we're waiting for the last couple of people, um, and I have you as a captive audience, it would be a good moment to do a shout out for anyone who uh, wants to volunteer during the Stop the Armstrong Week of Action, as well as um, being keen to attend um, and be part of the protests. Um, we're looking for a few different people to do specific volunteer roles on site. Um, first off, if you have been trained by Green and Black Cross and you are a trained legal observer, we would really love to hear from you because um, we are, um, we'll be providing legal support through the whole week of action and if anyone has um, GBC training and is able to volunteer to cover one of the legal observer shifts on site, we would absolutely love to have you. Um, I'll tell you how you can um, let me know that you might be interested in these volunteer roles in a minute. Um, another role that we have on site that we need people for is anyone who has relatively up-to-date first aid training. Um, we do have a welfare tent that's going to be running all week and they are looking for people who have either um, like first aid, normal first aid skills, um, but also ideally some people who are trained in mental health first aid. Um, so if you're interested in that role, um, we'd be really keen to hear from you as well. Um, and if you are an adult who has had a DBS check, so that's the check that you do um, to kind of get a certificate that says that um, your record's clean so that you can work with vulnerable adults and children. Um, a role that we need a few people to volunteer for is um, to be appropriate adults. Um, it's kind of like a variation on doing a police station support role. So an appropriate adult is someone who provides police station support to um, anyone under the age of 18 who's been arrested who for whatever reason doesn't want to get um, or can't get a parent or guardian to come and support them at the police station. Um, but that role is only open to people that have had, uh, that have recent DBS checks just for safeguarding reasons. Um, and the last role that we are hoping that some of you might want to volunteer for is um, just police station support. Um, so through the, through the Know Your Rights briefing, we'll be talking a little bit about um, what happens when you're arrested. Um, and for a lot of people, especially if it's their first arrest, um, being arrested can be a bit of a, um, it's a bit of a process to go through um, and a really nice thing that we can provide for people if they've been arrested is we can make sure that there's a friendly face waiting for them in the police station lobby um, and that, uh, those are our lovely police station support volunteers. Um, so if you're interested in volunteering for any of those um, you can email me and I'm gonna, if you have a pen handy, um, my email address is cat, which is k-a-t, at c-a-a-t dot org dot uk. So you can let me know um, your availability for the week of action and which role you think we might be interested in taking on. Um, but I think that, yeah, now that I've done the volunteer shout out while you were all waiting for proper content, I think we've probably got most of the people um, signed in now that are going to join us. So I might hand over to our lovely Know Your Rights people um, by the very high-tech method of tilting the laptop towards <laughs> you. <laughs> so, there we go. You. Hi, yeah. I'm Andy. And I'm Jack. And Jack is going to start by going through the five key messages. Which is good because I, my memory doesn't go much beyond five points. So, <laughs> um, in the, uh, the activist legal support community, we have uh, five take-home messages that if you remember nothing else of what we say, holding on to these five points will stand you in uh, good stead uh, no matter what happens uh, when you're on the ground. Some of you, if you've um, had some interaction with uh, us before or if you've ever got a bus card, and bus card is a little, uh, a little piece of card Oh, have you got one on you? Somewhere. Do a little demo. Yeah. I've got some in my backpack if you don't. Yeah, me too. Which tells you it's got a bit of legal advice, it's got some good lawyer's numbers on. Um, we'll get one in a minute. Our five key messages are as follows. Number one is uh, no comment. And what we mean by this is that you... Uh, no, there's no such thing as a friendly chat with a police officer. Anything you say to them, like they say in the, you know, the American cop shows, can and will be used against you. And, uh, ah, here is a bus card. There, see it there, it's got some lawyers numbers on. The police are constantly gathering intelligence, even when they don't seem to be. That's one of the hallmarks of British policing, is how intelligence focused it is. 
um, you will, uh, police officers will try and engage you in conversation, um, particularly ones in light blue bibs known as police liaison officers. Now they will try and claim that they are just being nice and friendly, but we know through uh, court cases um, that that is part and parcel of their intelligence gathering operation and their efforts to promote what they call self-policing. It's basically doing their job for them. And the point really is that even if they were just having a friendly chat with you, you wouldn't be able to know the difference. There is, at the point of contact, no you know, perceptible difference between a friendly chat and an intelligence gathering exercise. And for the purposes of keeping yourself safe, but also other people, no comment. Keep, you know, you don't have to be rude about it. You just say, officer, I don't have to talk to you and I will be choosing not to. And that leads us on quite, quite well onto no personal details. Now this says that basically when you're on a protest, when you're on the street, there is no reason for you to be handing over your name or address. The police will want to get hold of it. It will. Why? Because as I said, they like to build uh, their databases, their maps, and they will, will ask you. And at times they will say, you know, that they, you know, they will make it sound pretty official, pretty demanding. Point is you don't have to give it and you shouldn't volunteer it. Um, so for instance, there is no stop and search power which requires you to give your name and address to the police. So that's no stop and search power. The only times when you are required to give your name and address is when you are in a car and uh, you are the driver of that car, not merely the passenger, the driver. And if the police suspect you of antisocial behavior, which while it does occur on protest is not something we're anticipating, I think it's, Fair to say. No, there is specific things in um, adapting to protest. The last document that the police brought out on, on protest Mama. saying that um, um, the powers um, for demanding name and address for antisocial behaviour should not be used on protests because they infringe on your Article 10 and 11 rights, the freedom of expression and the freedom of assembly. So unless there is actual violence, we would not expect those powers to be usable. Absolutely. And the only other exception would be, of course, if they wanted to summons you for a, an offence, wouldn't it? And that's not a, a, you don't have to give them that, but they may arrest you if you don't give a, an address for summoning. There are other exceptions. If they suspect you are a peddler, contrary to the 1872 Peddlers Act, and you are trying to sell goods, they can demand your name and address. There's lots of other weird exceptions, but they won't happen, so don't worry about it. And what's more, our general advice is that you should never give your name and address before you ever get to a police station, even if you're being arrested. We'll cover arrest more in, in a bit, but basically, there have been cases, including ones that quite recently, where the uh, police have arrested people basically merely to get their name and address, and um, which is not allowed, but it doesn't mean they won't do it. One of the big things we want to emphasise is there's a difference between what the law said and what it says and what the police's own regulations say and what actually happens. But by keeping your name and address to yourself until minimum you get to a police station and the custody desk you will be once again keeping yourself safe and making the police you know police by the book effectively anything else no lovely the uh, next key message is no duty solicitor and so if you're arrested you have the right to free legal advice the police will encourage you to use the duty solicitor um, which is a uh, solicitor that is uh, assigned, basically, they're on a rotor system to the police station. Uh, they're not all, you know, bad people or in the pockets of the police by any means, but what they're not is experts on protest law. Protest law is a very specific area which requires specialist knowledge and um, 
you know, people that are barristers in complete other areas are as ignorant as a person in the street sometimes about the basics of protest law. So if you're going to get arrested, and if you're going to put yourself at that risk, you just want to be represented by people that know what they're talking about. And we work very closely with uh, several law firms that are experts, that are the best of the best, and have got your back if the worst was to happen. So what we suggest is that you use one of the firms that we have on our bus card. They're also, you can, oh, yeah, I think you need to raise it up a bit. Yeah. Okay. And they're available on the internet. You can find them if you just Google the NetPol recommended solicitors list, or you get hold of a legal observer on site at the time, and they'll be able to give you one of those. No duty solicitor, go with one of the ones we recommend. Next up, no caution. A caution is something the police might offer you um, after they've arrested you. It's, uh, basically an easy win for them. Uh, what it involves is you, you basically admitting you did something and the police uh, accepting that uh, and uh, basically they make it go away. So in the sense you don't have to go through court, uh, the police don't have to prove anything and they don't have to convince anyone that you actually did it. What they're relying on is you saying yes I did do it, please let me go and we can have this all done with now. Cautions still turn up later on on things like enhanced DBS checks. We talked about uh, DBS checks for um, appropriate adulting and they do turn up there. It also is just it is a very easy win for the police. It goes to they've got an incentive for it because I mean they, they don't have to do any work. They don't have to build a case. They don't have to convince a judge or a jury and it helps their crime statistics. Most of the time, the theory goes, they're offering it to you because they are not necessarily convinced that they could win that case in court. Otherwise, why are they offering you the easy way out, as they would put it? Anything else, Ryan? No. Lovely. Finally, the fifth key message is under what power? It's a bit different to the others, in the sense that under what power is about holding the police to account. Now, when a police officer does something, they should be doing it not merely because they happen to decide they want a certain thing. If they should be doing it, they, they're, they're meant to be basically enforcing the law. Once again, the difference between what happens in practice and what happens in theory is quite large at this point. But the point is, is that if a police officer is telling you to do something, they should have a, a piece of law that um, justifies that and they should be able to tell you what it is. Now, that's often that they aren't able to and often that they will just make something up. Um, but the point is, is that it changes up the relationship between protesters and police officers because it makes the police justify what they're doing. It makes, it puts them on notice that people, you know, are watching them, that uh, they are um, paying attention to what is being said to them. They're not just doing things because a police officer tells them. Because the police often rely on that, right? They often just rely on people doing what they say because they say it. And that's a way for them to uh, push protesters around in a metaphorical sense. I mean, they also do the, the non-metaphorical pushing as well, <laughs> but um, everything they do should follow well, it should be done by the book, and it's important that we hold them to that. And that's why if a copper tells you to do something, you can just politely ask, oh, am I legally obliged to do that, officer? Under what power? Make them tell you. Otherwise, they are arguably, well, I won't swear. 
Um, <laughs> Just for the recording. <laughs> absolutely. Um, lovely. Anything else to add? No, I think that we can now move on to the happy thing that is common offences. Um, so, um, in the history of Dicey, we have had um, uh, a number of different phases, but we can characterise the recent stuff as largely being involved of blocking um, the entry to um, the arms fair itself. Um, and the most common offence, which has been for the last two dices covering about 90% of the arrests, is section 137 of the Highways Act 1980 willfully obstructing the highway. Um, it is a relatively trivial offence. Um, the maximum penalty is a level three fine, which is uh, £1,000. The um, reality uh, for most people um, is if you plead guilty to it, you get £85 costs and a £20 victim surcharge. Explain about the victim surcharge a little later, the sentencing bit. Um, and if you fight it out and are found guilty, then the costs go up by a few hundred pounds, um, depending on how many people you're in trial with. Um, so there's no big risk. You can't be imprisoned for it. You can't get community service. Um, but if you choose to fight it, you will spend quite a time in the legal system. And partly is this because we have been doing reasonably well. Um, to throw our minds back um, to uh, 2015, um, quite a few people were acquitted of obstructing the highway on what is called a necessity defence. And this is a defence that what they were doing was necessary to prevent a uh, crime, usually um, by using the weapons from the ice, um, arms fair in other countries. And um, I hate to say this, there are actually some nice judges in the world. And one of them is District Judge Hamilton, who sits at um, uh, Stratford um, Magistrates Court. And he let quite a lot of people off saying that, yeah, that's perfectly reasonable to stop people being blown up. Um, and it seemed a quite fair judgment to me, but um, uh, the High Court disagreed. Um, and in a case called Mengesha, um, they ruled against using that defence, saying that um, if people um, objected to people being blown up across the world, then they should write to their MP or um, generally um, uh, buy a wind machine so that they could piss into it. Um, <laughs> now, um, um, in 2017, um, that defence having been blocked out, our uh, trusty legal team came up with a new line of defence saying that the obstructions to the highway were a proportionate use of the highway. Um, again, we refer back to Articles 10 and 11 of the Human Rights Act. And recent judgments since they came into force in, um, into English law in 2000 is that previously the highway was just to pass and repass, but now having a lawful demonstration is a legal use of the highway. And um, District Judge Hamilton again ruled in, in our favour on uh, two cases. And the Crown Prosecution Service uh, didn't like that and they went sulking back to the High Court. And um, High Court gave this judgment, um, um, which you can look up online, and it's only 25 pages long. Um, and to cut to the short, they said no. Uh, they said um, uh, blocking the highway for as much as 80 minutes was definitely an obstruction and that District Judge Hamilton was biased in favour of protesters and and they overturned the acquittals and convicted everyone. Not everyone. In the eight people involved in this case, um, although the High Court found against them, actually only four are reconvicted. And that is because the Crown Prosecution Service 
was too late in taking the case against four of them. They missed the 21 day gap that they had to appeal. And this is another important thing about the legal justice is that even when the law seems very against us, it is often in people's interest to fight out cases because we win on what the Daily Mail would say are technicalities, but in fact <laughs> are actual principles of law. And the Crown Prosecution Service is immensely overworked and incompetent, and they are always making mistakes. The cops are also incompetent. They are constantly losing evidence and making mistakes. And so, despite the fact that the, the legal position in both of um, the last two dioceses has been reversed against us, of the actual 103 people arrested um, in 2017, the amount of convictions, and that includes people who pleaded guilty just to get it out of the way because they couldn't face uh, going through this horrible process, uh, was, I believe, 26? It's 26, 28. Yeah. Really, it was quite a small proportion. Yeah. Um, so even with the law stacked against us, one, you've, you've still got a chance Two, there's no major consequences for what we think is going to be the principal offence, other than a lot of boring time in court, but you will get to meet some nice people um, who will be doing the court support, and, uh, and you will get some um, quite a lot of free, le um, free legal advice from the top um, protest um, lawyers in the country. Um, now, there are a number of other offences that I'll try to go through relatively quickly. The first is, there is, we suspect, and having talked to our uh, pet lawyers on this, there is a possibility that they may switch and try to arrest people under the Public Order Act, um, Section 14, in which the police impose conditions on an ecstatic assembly. Um, they have used this en masse against Extinction Rebellion recently, rather than struck the highway. And it is possible that they may switch track. However, um, it is not certain because um, Section 14 requires you to knowingly disobey conditions that are lawfully imposed for certain specific reasons, which are um, serious risk of violence, serious um, risk of damage to property, or serious disruption to the life of the community, which are less likely to apply to the arms fair than they would to a central London demonstration blocking bridges for several days. Um, but it is a possibility that they will switch to that. Um, we will have a better idea on day one when we see how the cops react to this year's protest. So that's one to keep in the, the back pocket. Obviously, there may be people who actually get onto the um, Excel Centre's premises, and then there is a possibility that people will be um, arrested and potentially charged with something called aggravated trespass. Uh, this I'm going to go far down the details of, is a slightly more uh, significant um, offence uh, that is technically imprisonable, but in reality, um, most people get fines for, if you've done it a few times before, you may be looking at community service or possibly a suspended sentence. Um, um, and to commit aggravated trespass, um, surprisingly enough, you have to trespass and then you have to aggravate it by uh, committing a second act, which is something that intimidates, disrupts or obstructs lawful activity going on on the land that you are trespassing on. And that's always quite a good one to argue out in court because uh, making bombs is not um, the most popular of lawful activities. Um, unfortunately, the courts keep ruling against us on, on this one as well, but um, it is a very good opportunity to force um, the Crown Prosecution Service and by 
implication the arms fair to put forward while they are doing all this stuff lawfully when we know that there are loads of unlawful weapons uh, um, it may happen that some of the protesters um, damage some of the things going in to the arms fair and it's possible that the police will mistakenly arrest those people for criminal damage um, for like tank scratching or whatever um, they decide is. is um, again, this is a, a bit of a strange offence because um, it depends on how much value of damage you do. If you succeed in destroying a tank, um, the value will be certainly above £5,000, so you'll be entitled to a jury trial and it will be make a big celebrity out of you and um, that will be um, very, very good and we will obviously support you through that. The vast majority of criminal damage cases are of under £5,000. They are held in the magistrates only. The big difficulty to that, the penalties again will probably be a fine or worse community service, but there is the danger with criminal savage, uh, damage of compensation orders uh, against you to pay back. So it's worth not having any money if you're gonna do those things because then they can't get it off you. Um, and um, so to give you an example, unrelated case, we had uh, someone who, um, graffitied their university with the um, with chalk saying uh, pay your cleaners a decent wage and uh, the university uh, said that to clean it off their foundation stone they required new specialist cleaners and it cost a thousand pounds and they got a thousand pounds compensation order against her uh, so yeah that's the sort of sneaky thing that is also possible with criminal damage um, just to line up. There is a Criminal Damage Act 1971. I should say that all these laws you can look up free online on the government's uh, legislation.gov website uh, if you feel like, like reading them. Uh, the same for, for the court cases, particularly Ziegler, um, if you want to read that because it goes quite, quite through um, just putting in DPP versus Ziegler and we'll get it really quickly. Um, so there's a Criminal Damage Act in 1971, but also there's a Malicious Damages Act of 1861, um, and that's still in force for a couple of uh, ridiculous offences, um, one of which is uh, climbing on trains. Um, it's slightly more complicatedly worded than that, but it has happened in the past that people going to the arms fair have decided to go on the DLR and not inside the train because who would want to? It's filled with horrible arms dealers um, and instead you actually go um, on top of the train and then the train has to stop um, because it's a health and safety issue. Uh, so there is a somewhat more serious uh, offence under section 36 of the Malicious Damages Act and people have been prosecuted for that and given suspended sentences. In theory, it's imprisonable. Um, it is unlikely that you, you, know, um, you may have noticed that there are some people being done for the same thing from Extinction Rebellion uh, stuff for climbing on, on trains. Um, the thing that I will mention with uh, this is that is one of the things that allows you to get a jury trial um, uh, but the downside of jury trials is that they are quite slow at the moment and particularly so for transport cases. Um, because it's the DLR, it's the responsibility of the British Transport Police, all their cases um, used to go to Blackfriars Crown Court, which is being closed in December. Uh, this has resulted in chaos. Um, so some of the people who were arrested in April for the XR thing have a trial scheduled for May next year. Um, as one of them who is 83 year, years old said to me uh, coming out of court, I'll try and work it around my funeral. So um, be prepared for the fact that, that cases can take a long time. Magistrate courts 
effective now, averaging about three or four months before you get to trial and a good year for clinical practice. Um, couple of other, other things. Um, there is the wonderfully named TOLCRA, the Trade Union Labour Relations and Consolidation Act of 1992, of which section 241 um, makes it illegal to watch and beset workers uh, going about their lawful business. Um, um, it is a ridiculously worded because it is a word for word reenaction of the Conspiracy and Protection of Property Act of 1885. Um, and occasionally people get done for that when the cops can't think of anything better to do them for. Um, there is an outside chance of people being done for public nuisance, again, a catch-all thing. But we have had recent success um, in the Court of Appeal on, on this. And although it is technically a serious offence that protesters have been um, jailed for in the past, Trenton Oldfield being the great example of uh, someone who swam in front of the boat race, uh, got six months for it. But recent judgment in, in High Court has overturned prison sentences, pressed a new road for anti-fracking stuff and replaced them with community service. So um, we're not particularly worried. It is quite likely that someone somewhere will get arrested for obstructing the police in the course of their duty because it's very easy to obstruct them because they're annoying and they get in your way and, uh, and you just feel like, um, or they just get bored with you and decide to leave. Um, again, that's a relatively trivial thing that um, they can deal with, and then we, they have to prove that they were acting in the course of duty. Um, one last thing is that. Um, we were going to say at the start, to go all Donald Trump's fault, is that um, we don't know uh, what you know, and there are um, uh, things that we know that are unknown, and then there's no unknown unknowns. Uh, so we're sort of talking uh, at people that we're not sure if we're patronising you by um, saying things that you already know, or completely missing out on uh, things to do. So we'll come to that in the, the Q and A, but we're going to leave out a lot of what we would regularly do on common um, common offences for protesting so nothing on the public order act sections one through five nothing on um, various assaults uh, but bear in mind that those those things are there if, if something does, does happen okay and lastly i will mention what are called incohate offences and these are offences where the actual thing has happened but people um, are planning to do them. So you can conspire to commit any offence, you can encourage or assist any offence, you can attempt any indictable offence, that's a serious offence for which you can get a jury trial, and you can aid, abet, counsel or procure any offence. Um, and this is just to, to sort of flag up the fact in anything that you do or that you say, um, there is a huge difference between saying we're here to protest and we're going to do as much as we can to um, disrupt the arms fair and doing what Extinction Rebellion have been doing, saying we want to get people convicted and put in jail because then not only the people who actually do stuff uh, can be convicted, but everyone else involved in the process, which uh, we really could do without uh, <laughs> because of the hard work of, uh, of, of trying to the extra court cases. Um, I think I've bored on long enough. Lovely. So I'm probably teaching some of you how to suck eggs at this point, but I'm going to go briefly through what happens when you're uh, arrested. If the worst was to happen, and it's a, it's a big if, as, as Andy says, you know, kind of the process can be that you, uh, you do something that you think is definitely going to get arrested and you get away with it or that you don't do anything and you still get arrested. What happens is, um, is basically this. So the police will say, it will tell you that, you say, you know, I'm Sergeant Jack, based at a Catholic police station, I'm placing you under arrest on suspicion of 
x. So they should be telling you what um, uh, what uh, they are arresting you for. They should be telling you who you, who they are as well. If they aren't in uniform, they should be showing you a warrant card, and um, they will then probably give you a little bit of a pat down, check your pockets, make sure you've not got anything there. They may cuff you. They shouldn't really be cuffing you unless you're posing a, 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 a risk to yourself or the police or the people, but that they don't, uh, they cuff a lot more regularly than that, shall we say. Particularly if uh, you're a person of colour, um, you know, we've just had Notting Hill Carnival at the weekend, just, you'd, if you've been there you've seen uh, various uh, children uh, cuffed being searched, for example. And with you know, in a bit of an outcry recently about the use of uh, uh, the use of uh, of cuffs during search processes, you'll then be taken probably to a car or to a van, and you're going to be driven to a station in the local vicinity. And while you're being driven there, um, the police might try and engage you in conversation. They might ask you your name. In fact, when they first arrest you, they might ask you your name. As we said in the key messages, we advise not giving it at that point. You don't have to say nothing. You can just say, I'm going to wait till I get to the station office. You know, you can be perfectly polite about it. They'll also try and probably engage you in a friendly chat. Once again, we recommend you don't do it. Simply because, you know, as we said, sometimes they have arrested people just to get their name and address and then booted them out afterwards. And in which case they've managed to get their intelligence for pretty much nothing. You'll be then be taken to the station, and as you're taken into the station, you'll be brought to the custody desk, basically like um, the you know the check-in desk of the worst hotel you've ever been in. Um, and this is presided over by a custody sergeant. When you're there, they will ask you certain questions, one of which would be your name and address. Now. You have a choice at this point whether you give your name and address or not. You're not legally obliged to, but if, for instance, you have anything that identifies you on your person, ID um, or uh, passport, um, then um, they're going to find out who you are anyway. If you're already known to the police, if you've been arrested before, then uh, your DNA or your fingerprints will come up on the system and so they will find out who you are anyway. If you don't give your name and address, uh, they will in, in all likelihood hold you for longer. Uh, they can hold you for up to 24 hours uh, before making a decision to charge you or not. And if they make the decision to charge you, they can then take you to court at the next available, well, the next day at six, which um, court if you arrest on the Friday of a bank holiday weekend would be a Tuesday. In the UK, you don't have to carry identification on you. It's not like European countries where you're required to have ID. And for, on the whole, we recommend that people don't. Um, and if you don't give your name and address and you haven't got ID on you, they will make your stay in custody less pleasant. For the simple reason is that they want it and it will be a right pain for them if they have to take you to court. One of the reasons you might want to not give your name and address is because it forces the police to make a decision about whether they charge you. We've had cases in the past, and this was more so when there was kind of mass arrests, that they'll just scoop up people without any real basis for, for picking particular people. And these arrests never, never produce charges. If you, if you don't give your name and address and they have no way of establishing it, then it forces them to make a decision about whether they charge you because in order to be charged, the Crown Prosecution Service has to make a judgment that there's a reasonable chance of, uh, of you getting convicted. And so it forces the police to kind of show their hand quite early on, really. And we're big fans of that. Other questions they'll ask you at the, uh, at the desk are, for instance, they might ask you your nationality. Now, they can ask you this, they will ask you it as standard and um, refusing to answer or giving a false answer or, um, 
is itself an offence. We've not actually seen the police and the Crown Prosecution Service pursue this for people that have um, that haven't given it. But this is a new, was a new piece of legislation that came in what last year, year yeah. before, which which does make this an offence. So if and the police can ask you on very flimsy grounds basically they just have to have suspicion not even reasonable suspicion and um so obviously if you're a person of color or you have an accent whatever that is um and or you have you are heard to speak in a, a language that's not english they they might well ask you once you're arrested they can also uh require you to uh produce a proof of this for nationality within 72 hours um, other questions that people will ask, uh, what well, will be asked, will include things like your mental health. Um, this is a case in which our usual no comment advice, we, is perhaps an exception to. If you no comment the question on, for instance, if you have a history of self-harm, for safeguarding reasons, the police are forced to treat that as a yes, you do have a history of self-harm, which means they'll be checking on you a lot. If, you, if it's at night, they'll be meaning you, every hour or so, they'll be having a look in preventing you getting a bit of sleep. So that's a judgment call for you to make. If you think we would advise usually just saying, no, you don't, unless you think you are at risk during the, uh, or, uh, or will, you know, yeah, if you think that you are not going to be safe in your time, they will give you a, um, uh, a copy of PACE, which is the codes that govern you have to ask for it. You have to ask for it. Yes. Oh, okay. Well, ask for you it. You get a notification sheet of your rights, um, but to actually have the full codes of practice, you have to um, ask them. It's quite boring in custody, so it's worth taking a book. And, you know, as boring as the PACE codes are, it can provide you with something to read, and it's always nice to know what they are and aren't allowed to do in theory. They will also give you a proper search, look in your bag, turn out your pockets, and then in all likelihood, they will try and take your DNA and fingerprints and put your photo. Now, if you are only arrested for willful obstruction of the highway, you do not have to give your prints and DNA. In other, for other uh, offenses, other than willful obstruction of the highway, they can use reasonable force to get those from you. Now, what qualifies as reasonable force in uh, the average constable's book. It's quite different to what the rest of us would qualify as reasonable force. And it, you know, it would be pretty forceful. But if it's only obstruction of the highway you've been arrested for, you do not have to provide it. That doesn't mean the cops won't force you to, but they're not meant to. And if they were, the, uh, our friendly local lawyers would have a field day with them further down the line. At that point, they'll probably take you to the cell, sit there. If you've got a book, it's worth asking, asking if you can have it. Depends on their mood, they don't have to provide it. You also have the right to have someone notified that you've been arrested. In this case, we would recommend that people use the number at the bottom of the bus card. That, during Dicey, will be running a, a back office, which will um, allow us to act as a central hub of information to coordinate arrestee support, make sure we've got people in the right stations, people call in and want to know where their loved ones are, it means we can tell them. Otherwise, we're chasing around everyone's sister, mother, you know, cocker spaniel to try and find out where people are. You also have the right to, uh, to free legal advice. As we said earlier, no duty solicitor, use one of our as Andy put it, pet solicitors, I'm sure they love to hear that, um, which are given on the bus card, they're the people for you. They might want to interview you. If we're seeing a lot of arrests that week, it tends not to be interviewed so much. But if they do, you certainly don't want to be doing it without your lawyer present. And if they absolutely force you, no comment the entire thing. But that's the advice the lawyers will give you almost certainly. Why? Because when you're in a cell, maybe you've been there for some time, is pretty much the worst place you could be to try and start making decisions about what your case would be in a prospective trial, maybe six months down the line. Literally the worst place to be making those kind of decisions. The only people that stand to benefit from you saying anything 
in that situation is the police. When we say no comment, when we give you these key messages, it's not just stuff we pulled out of the air, it's stuff we produced in collaboration with these protest lawyers who know a thing or two. Um, when you're talking to your lawyer, it's very useful if you can tell them that it's okay for them to pass on information about you and your arrest. Because although you're entitled to have someone informed, it's one brief phone call and it's usually one made by the police rather than your, yourself. So when you're, if you tell your lawyer that you are happy for GBC to know about this and the Dicey legal team to know about what's happened, where you are, then that will make it much easier for us to get people to the police station to let anyone else that uh, knows who needs to know where, where you are. Um, it's, yeah, uh, it's just really helpful because lawyers are bound by uh, issues of confidentiality. So if you tell them it's okay, then they, they can cooperate more fully with us. Yeah. Do you want to cover outcomes? That we'll... Yeah, so um, they've got 24 hours. Um, 24 hours, by the way, starts when you're booked in at the police station, not when you're arrested. It's a cheating little rule. Um, and if for any reason you have to be taken to hospital to be treated, uh, the clock stops while you're away from the police station and starts again when you come back. Um, and there are circumstances where it can go beyond 24 hours, up to 36 hours on the authority of a superintendent and up to 96 hours on the authority of uh, local magistrates, but you'd have to do something more serious than anyone has managed at Dicey yet. Um, to get an award, I think. Yes, you would, would be getting the um, Colantai cross for that. Um, um, at the end of this 24 hours, the cops have a number of options. The best is that they, and here we're going for a lot of acronyms, um, is your NFA'd. No further action is taken against you. You know, just released, and then we can talk about um, uh, what legal steps you wish to take next against the police. Um, the most common outcome at the moment is your RUID. Uh, RUID stands for Released Under Investigation, in which you're just kicked out of the cop shop and they say, well, we think about um, whether to charge you or not. And you will just twist in the wind uh, for a great deal of time until they can make up their mind about whether they're going to, to do it. The cops don't actually do the making up of their minds. They have to talk to the Crown Prosecution Service, who, as I might have mentioned earlier, are stupid and lazy. Uh, and so it does take a, a many months usually. To come um, <clears throat> if the case is more serious or they don't have a, a legitimate address for you, they may um, bail you to return to the police station. And so at that point, the custody clock stops and starts again when you're due to return. And so you can still be interviewed for a second time, unlike if you're ruined uh, when they can't interview again. We think that there may be a bit of a rethink on this because with XR, vast numbers of people were ruined um, and then um, when they realised that most of these people hadn't been interviewed um, and therefore it was very difficult to convict people if they haven't uh, made confessions or at least had the uh, prosecution case put to them, which they haven't denied, um, loads of people were invited in for voluntary interviews, um, which um, we told them not to. Most people have actually seen the sense on that, so um, it's do it. possible yeah that they may want to bail a lot of people and they may want to bail them particularly for Dicey because it's an ongoing protest. And if they bail people and put bail conditions on you, then they can re-arrest you for breaking those conditions at various points later in the week. So that I think is, is quite likely. Um, the other thing that has been mentioned earlier is um, they may offer you a caution. Um, refer to the previous uh, answer. I mean, obviously, if they offer you a caution for GBH or the chief inspector, uh, you might consider taking it. But um, uh, in general, uh, no. Um, and the last one is um, that they will um, um, charge you with some offence. Uh, they probably will have lawyers from CPS in various stations. And so they can um, 
charge you on the spot and then they will most likely just give you a court date to turn up to and if they really really don't like you then um they will keep you for the next four months where almost any you will get that off you so you have to do a lot these days to get them on. um <clears throat> uh i think that's the though it should be said that um um people do um suffer injury and worse in police custody and one of the things that we've had in the run-up to this dicey is a man who was uh killed being arrested by police outside the arms fair uh initially um, um arrested by the security and then helped. and surprise again the person of color so um one of the things to keep an eye out for is that potentially later in the week particularly the friday and saturday we may have greater participation from local community and that will feature a lot more young people people of color people who the cops are far more likely to be violent to than uh, nice middle class protesters and anyone who's in the police station can exercise a really good effect for those people if they are there by keeping an eye out by protesting if they see that anything is happening because the one thing that cops do not like is people wondering what they do and watching out for uh, frequent um, breaches of the uh, yeah and just a just a thing to say about young people there is that if you are under 18 and you are arrested you are they're meant to and you're going to be interviewed they're going to need an appropriate adult present so that's in addition to a lawyer for example now that the cop's first choice for an appropriate adult would be uh, either you know a parent or a carer a guardian of some mm. form it's got to, it's it's can't just be kind of some randomer that we've put in the station because it's meant to have a personal connection with you. Um, this is also applies for uh, people that they regard as vulnerable. So for example, um, we've, uh, if you have a learning disability, for example, um, that uh, you would have the right to have a appropriate adult present. Now, we're, as part of the Dicey support, appropriate adult service is being run. Um, we have a separate, we have a separate phone number yeah. for it. Yeah. How would people get hold of um, that? I will go and grab the phone number and be prepared to give it at the end of this call. Beautiful. So that will be available for people there. Um, I can't think of anything else on the, on the rest. Um, if you need, if you need to see, uh, you've got any, if you sustain any injuries or you have any pressing health needs during your time in custody, you can ask to, see a, a medic of some form, isn't it, can't you? Yes. Um, they're often a police medic, however. And uh, if- The FME, the Forensic Medical Examiner. Which makes it sound a little fatal. But, yeah. Uh, but, um, yeah. And obviously if they notice any injuries, they will um, have you examined anyway. Yeah. And that's just the cops covering their own back. It's not because they want you to be any better. But, uh, Absolutely. True. I think we've covered the rest. I think yes, and uh, I think we've taken up whoa, whoa. nearly five to five to eight. So I suppose we should better answer difficult questions. Um, um so I'm going to jump back on screen sideways. Um, so some of you I can see have found um, because you've been using it beautifully the little um, group chat that Zoom offers. Um, somewhere along the bottom of your screen, you might see a little chat box icon. If you click into that, you'll be able to see the group chat. So some people before this call um, submitted some questions that they'd like addressed. And some people during this call um, have um, submitted a couple of questions about things that um, they wonder about the, the law around. Um, so we've got a few of those noted down. We're not going to spend like forever and ever on Q&A because I know you guys have had tons of information um, all in one go now. Um, but we did want to give you the opportunity to ask questions. Um, one thing that I would say about asking questions um, that I would hope goes a little bit without saying is um, you might be wondering about a specific action you would like to organise on site. Um, given that this is a 
public call, although we've got people to register, this is kind of like a public call. This probably isn't the space for you to ask really specific questions about what the legal consequences of an action you might be considering on site is. Um, at the end of this call, I'm going to do a little like admin, admin roundup thing with a couple of useful places you can look for resources and places that you could go to get some specific and more secure legal advice in this. So please keep your questions more to the sort of general or hypothetical um, end of the spectrum. Well, that seems fair. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, do you want me to read out yeah, the question? Yeah. yeah okay. Um, so one of the questions that we had submitted um, in advance of this call was um, from MedAct, who are the medi uh, a medical peace and activism charity. And they're going to have a lot of doctors on site and other people who um, work in sort of sensitive professions where they would really like to not have a criminal record because it would interfere with their ability to work. So they were just wondering if there was anything extra that they might be need to consider on site or anything that they could do to minimise the risk of arrest. Other than not be there. Yeah. <laughs> and not commit any crimes. Um, um, yeah. Um, other than, um, obviously, um, the only thing that we could particularly advise is be aware of where you are because you may end up being with people who are doing stuff and that could end in everyone being in a kettle or um, um, people being arrested on suspicion because um, as you may know for enhanced DBS checks um, any interaction with the police can be used even if you're not convicted. So, um, yeah, um, I'm afraid the only real answer to that is you have to be cowardly. Um, I suppose one thing you could say is that with some offences like willful obstruction of the highway, the police, because they need to demonstrate that it's willful, will go through a process of basically encouraging you off the road, for example, asking you to leave the road. So in that case, you do get a bit of notice that at the end you might get nicked. We can't sit here and promise you that, that, you know, being there, not thinking you're doing anything will mean you're absolutely immune to arrest. But with, with the dicey protests in general, if you exercise a little bit of caution, a bit of awareness, and you listen to what the police are actually saying to you, it means that you have a bit more time and space to make that judgment call. Um, once again, we can't guarantee, but keep your wits about you and you'll be in better um, The next question was um, something that quite a few people asked about actually, which was um, what kinds of things might people who um, don't hold British citizenship need to consider if they're on site? And can you be deported for protesting? Um, no, um, you can be deported um, if you receive a Deported by the courts if you receive a prison sentence of uh, one year or more or two years or more if you are um, an EU citizen. That's the situation as it stands at the moment. So very, very unlikely um, that, that you are in any risk of being deported by the courts for what you do at DICE. If you are arrested, however, there are now lots of immigration officers sitting around in police stations handing out um, stuff about to anyone that they suspect of not being a British citizen and now that they've got power to demand stuff. If you are not got um, leave to remain in this country then there is a likelihood that they will issue you with a, a long sort of statement saying um, we are investigating, trying uh, to get you thrown out of the country. Um, and it's become such a plague at police stations now. We have had British citizens given the forms. Um, um, but it is not, it is not a, a complete loss or defeat. Every, every case from that, they would actually have to go through the whole normal process of trying to get you you deported, which is extremely lengthy and uh, stuff. They will try to bully people into accepting um, a voluntary uh, leaving the country. There is in fact um, 
for several um, Eastern European countries, a regular free coach back uh, if you agree to just leave. Um, um, which can I, you can actually get tickets for at police stations or... Um, That's so dystopian. Yes. yes it, um, wow. Um, so, uh, yeah. Um, the avoidance is that it's not as bad as it seems, but it's getting worse. And that if you do not want that particular hassle, do some support role that doesn't involve you having to, to, to be in the front line. And you will be able to contribute just as well without. I think that's the big thing to, to say is obviously with uh, this little thing you might have heard of called Brexit on the horizon, what used to be certainties have now become, you know, uh, uncertainties. We don't know what is actually going to happen. We know what the government have said. We know that Priti Patel has said uh, that they want to make it harder for people with criminal records to be able to stay in this country. Um, and uh, it already is the case if you want to seek British citizenship, you have to prove good character. Now, what counts as good character is, is it's pretty flexible in terms of their judgment. And we don't know what's going to happen come, come the 31st of October. And if you're going to be seeking leave to, you know, leave to remain, as Andy said, really want to think hard about what kind of risks you're able to take before then. To put it bluntly, there will be plenty more time to get arrested at a later date. There are lots of support roles, there are lots of less arrestable positions to put yourself in. But once again, that is something that you, you know, if you don't have citizenship, don't have leave to remain, or perhaps you don't have papers at all, um, you really want to be thinking seriously about that. Yeah, I guess it's another, I know you guys have touched on it at various points throughout, but just acknowledging that the police are institutionally racist. And this is yes. one of the, um, we know that direct action um, is differently risked for different people, whether that's um, uh, people of colour being at a greater risk of police violence, um, or some of like the legal risk to you, um, sort of like your status to remain in the country. Um, at the beginning of this call, um, I went through a couple of the um, support roles that we are really, really keen that people um, volunteer for. And there's a ton of um, off-site or on-site roles that you could do, which are a little bit less than mine, to put you in a less legally um, and sometimes physically risky position. So, um, I'll probably recap those just at the end of this call. Um, but yeah, that, that's, that is something that we wanted to put out there. Um, we've got a few more questions that um, we're going to rattle through, if that's okay. Um, one of them is um, someone wanted to know what might happen if they were, um, if they'd been arrested at a previous protest and they were facing charges from it, but they didn't have any bail conditions that might prevent them from attending future protests. Um, they wondered what kinds of things they might need to consider on site and what might happen if um, they were arrested while they had open charges. Um. Nothing particularly bad. You simply will face two different charges and have two different um, uh, trials. If you get convicted of the first one, and then obviously that will be on your record when the, the second trial happens. But what it isn't is um, if you were on bail and you commit an offence while on bail, that's an aggravating factor for sentencing. So if you're simply awaiting a case, and you're not on bail, or you've been summoned, um, then you're in a, a less less difficult position. Um, and as we say, all offences add up. The more offences you you commit, the, but um, you've got to commit a lot of small scale um, what we are expecting for dicey offences before the courts get totally fed up with you and start bailing you. So yeah, um, it might mean that the first one you get a conditional discharge, the second one you get a fine. Um, three or four, you might end up with some community service if you've got something serious enough. But yeah, um, I wouldn't be particularly worried that you're facing one. Excellent. 
Um, that nicely answers a question that someone else had asked live in the chat box um, this evening, which was how does having a criminal record um, affect your legal risk on site? I think you probably just answered that one. Um, if that was your question and you didn't feel like that answered it, um, type it into the chat box and let me know. Um, what else have we got on the list? Um, we, you've, I think you might have touched on this briefly, but someone had submitted a question about um, what would happen if they were arrested on the Dicey site? They were bailed away from the Dicey site and then they turned back up at the Dicey site. It would partly depend if the police recognised you for one, um, which is not an encouragement either way, but just saying is that we had people two years ago who, uh, who did do that and found themselves re-arrested. That's what happens. If you break the bail conditions, then they can re-arrest you. Um, but then there were other people who uh, did exactly the same thing, but weren't recognised and, and were absolutely fine. Um, I mean, that's the, basically... The really important thing is that breaching bail conditions isn't a criminal offence. Yes. Um, it seems really weird and, and stupid. And if you're on police bail, all that they can do is release you on the same conditions. Thanks, um, please. Okay, so you can be bailed from the police station where the police decide that you're on bail until some date that you have to return to the police station, or you can be bailed by a court. And if you have been to court and been granted bail, it's still not an offence to break the bail conditions. But if you are arrested for breaking the bail conditions, the court can decide that you can have any more bail and that you'll be seen uh, the rest of the time until your trial in one of Her Majesty's special hot houses um, that must be boiling at the bloody moment. Um, and again you have to do quite a lot because prison places are very very uh, tight at the moment and you should not be jailed unless there is a, re a realistic prospect of a custodial sentence uh, which again is very very unlikely. So um, Basically, police, if you're on police bail, don't give a monkeys about it because uh, it doesn't matter. If you're on bail from a court, judges are slightly more serious people that uh, if you um, piss them off enough, then some bad things can happen. Thank you. Um, we had um, two questions, which again, I think might have been um, slightly covered, but actually I wonder if one of them is worth talking a little bit more about. Um, about one of which was at what points do you have to give your name and address, which I know you covered, but I wondered if you could recap. Um, one person had a question about carrying ID on them. Um, and it did occur to me that I know sometimes when the police stop and search people, they'll go through your wallet to yes. kind of get. Yeah. So um, just if you um, if you do have ID on you or you do have like things that could be used as ID on you, what might you need to consider if you were carrying those about your person? Well, I mean, when, so for instance, if you're stopped and searched, the police, on the whole, there is one exception, but one that isn't going to be used around Dicey. Need to be looking for something specific, you know, they need to be looking for a weapon, or they need to be looking for drugs, or, uh, you know, something that could be used in the commission of a crime. Um, a, an arm tube, for example. But the kind of objects that they're looking for dictate how they're meant to search you. So if they were looking for an arm tube, for example, there is no reason for them to be in your wallet. Now, that doesn't mean they won't be looking in your wallet. And they often, you know, with, say, weapons, for example, they don't usually say they're looking for a machete. They'll say they're looking for a bladed article, and that means they can go pretty much wherever they want. Um, and if they get in your wallet, and they happen to they just so happen to take out your bank card and have a look at your name on it, then obviously they, they're going to get that. Yeah, they will lie about that. One yeah. of our favourite stories from Dicey, and actually it's from 2003, is someone came to a legal observer and, and said, they've just gone through my wallet. Am I obliged to give them the PIN number to my cash card? Wow. And, yeah. Uh, so, um, I'm robbing cops. Uh, yeah. No, is the answer <laughs> yeah. to that. Um, <laughs> Um, can I, just to, just to check my yeah. inquiry, um, a bit of advice that I was given on it, because obviously stop and search is one of the powers that is used really disproportionately against people of colour. So I think it's oh, a yes. really good one for um, if people want to 
um, be like quite legally aware on site and hold the cops to account and they can see someone being stopped and searched. It's a good one for you to um, kind of go and try and monitor police behaviour if the police have been searched. It's really happy for you to do that. Um, I always told that um, if the police do want to search your wallet, you can take the cards out and show them the front and the back and put your thumb over your name on it. Is that allowed? Or it's allowed. Is that just a yes, it's a question of whether the, the whether they oblige. Just, yeah. yeah. Okay. It, with the case of stop and search, is that it? You know, what the cops are meant to do yeah. and what they do in practice. That is one of the places well, where it's just a huge difference. Yeah. Partly because the cops half the time don't even know themselves. To be honest, <laughs> if they learnt it, they forgot it miraculously. Um, one thing that's also worth saying is that when you stop and search, you have the right to a receipt. Um, and that can either be in a physical format or a lot of uh, forces are now switching to digital receipts in which places should be telling you how to get the digital receipt. Well, sometimes tell you you have to give your name and address to get the receipt. No, not at all. It's a sneaky cop trick and one you shouldn't fall for. Cool. Um, we've only got a couple of questions left and then we'll do maybe a little recap and a, a signpost to where you can um, both get a copy of this um, recorded so you can read it and where you can find more resources. Um, but we had um, a question that someone submitted on the live chat, but we've also had a few of the versions of this in advance, which is around um, what powers the police have to confiscate equipment. So um, some people are planning to um, do events or they want to set up a PA system or a speaker system. They're thinking about setting it up on the pavement rather than directly in the road, but they're unsure what kind of powers the police might have to confiscate if it gets the equipment. And if it was confiscated and it was um, an expensive or an important bit of equipment, if and how they could get it back. Yeah, okay. Uh, almost endless powers to seize um, anything that they believe is evidence um, under Police and Criminal Evidence Act. Uh, 1984 sections 19 through 22 um, and a common law to seize for, for evidence. Um, if you're convicted, uh, courts can uh, make confiscation or destruction orders on um, anything that has been seized in the, uh, that's for the use of the crime. And if the case is dropped <clears throat> or uh, you are acquitted, then the police should return it. Yeah, police are not good at returning things. Um, and Don't forget. I think they've still got some of our banners from 2017. Yeah. <laughs> um, the longest recent one I can think of is for um, a musical event called Scummerine. <laughs> um, um, uh, which... Classical. Yes. Um, <laughs> Lots of violins were confiscated. No, um, some sound systems were con uh, confiscated, and of the people, it was eventually dropped against one. It took them thirty-three months to get their sound system back um, because of uh, yeah. Um, it's a really, really difficult process, and that was for someone who was acquitted. If the proceedings are ongoing, uh, it the it is even harder. If the cops will not respond to you, then you get a pet solicitor to write on formal headed paper, and that sometimes works. The next step is that you can take, make an application under the Police Property Act. Um, and um, go to the magistrates and try to get it back. Uh, the next thing is that you can sue them in the county courts for the return of your property and you can um, eventually take a judicial review of their, um, their actions. These do not tend to work um, and another big example of course is Lowry Love uh, whose computers were seized some six years ago and is still not getting them back because the CPS say that um, and inquiries are ongoing to to whether to prosecute him. Um, so I suppose there's a related question to that, which is that that obviously covers for people that are arrested, but about say for instance merely seizing sound systems, which we have you know we have seen obviously in protests. Um, so people, so not arresting people, but then taking their sound systems, yeah. you know, because of they should give you a receipt 
for um, what they have seized if you're not arrested yourself. But yeah, they can, it, and to answer your specifics on your question, it doesn't matter if it's in the road, the pavement, um, anywhere, yeah. they can just seize. Yeah. Um, I can just spot that that person's asked a follow-up question, which is about equipment being confiscated from previous DSEI protests. Um, we've not, to my knowledge, I know you did back up as well, I don't think we saw any um, like big, expensive or like particularly exciting things getting seized in 2015 or 2017. The things that were seized were mainly um, a couple of props, which were definitely going to be used to obstruct the highway, like um, arm tubes that had been disguised as other things. Um, and I, I think a few banners, but um, we didn't see any, that doesn't mean it won't happen this year, but we haven't historically seen the police um, be really keen to take some of the bigger bits of kit. Um, it is a concern that we've also considered because we're doing things like parking a giant disabled toilet on site. <laughs> um, but um, historically the police have left, um, and again that doesn't mean it'll happen this year because the cops are weird and unpredictable. Um, but they have tended to leave some of the bigger things like the welfare gazebos um, or the sound systems and, and stuff. Um, they haven't tended to confiscate them. It's not technically dicey, but the space hijacker's armoured car got seized. <laughs> and if you're planning on bringing a boat, particularly one sprayed pink, oh, that yeah. probably will not be going home with you. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. Uh, hopefully that. Um, okay. I can just see there's another question. Um, yeah. We've got about three more questions. So um, we're, we are going to wrap up relatively soon um, and let you guys go, go about your business. Um, but we will sign paste to further resources and ways that you can ask more specific questions. But if you've got a burning question that you really, really want covered um, live on this call, now is the time <laughs> to type it into the box. Um, the, one of the last questions that we had was um, somebody um, is planning, submitted a question in advance, it's planning to be on site with their four-year-old and their five-year-old. And they wondered if um, we've talked a little bit about the um, provision, appropriate adult provision for under 18s who might get arrested. I think there's probably some parents out there that are thinking, what would happen if I got arrested when I am in charge of these small people? Nothing bad, to be honest. Um, the, um, the cops occasionally try to frighten people by saying, oh, your kids will be taken into care. But, and the police do have a power of um, taking um, unaccompanied children uh, into a place of safety. And then they have to contact social services and when social services realize that they're not perfectly accessible, um, and they even scale back. Uh, but it is obviously something that is intended by the cops to make um, parents incredibly nervous and, and frightened because being separated from your kids is uh, is a terrible thing. Um, I should add that um, if the kids are under 10, they can't commit any crimes because there is a um, presumption of only in um, that uh, no, you have to be 10 until you can commit any crimes. So if the, the little kids would like to commit some, if the fire away. Um, well, they can be stopped and searched. Yes, frightening, isn't it? Yeah. Um, you can imagine which demographic those kids are largely born from. Um, but yes, um, the, the important thing to, to remember is that it is not in the, in the cops' power what happens um, with kids. It's obviously far better if, you've got, if you're going to do something that you've got someone who can just look after them. Um, than, um, but um, yeah, if you get arrested and the cops stop doing the, the spiel, oh, your kids were with you, you're an irresponsible um, parent, uh, etc. etc. They can, um, yeah, um, just carry on on talking because uh, they've got no influence for that whatsoever. But it is worth saying that they will. There's a chance, particularly if you are a person of colour or that someone they perceive as kind of working class, that they that they will be nasty about it, um, and that they will use that against you. Um, but it, uh, as Andy said, it's, it's worth just bearing in mind that they are a lot of the time all tall. Um, we had two more questions and then um, if no one else submits any in the next two minutes, we'll go to the wrap up. Um, one person was wondering how solicitors charges work um, and specifically if people need to pay to access the support of the bus card lawyers. No. It's the, that was one of the easiest questions. Um, to divide it up into two bits, if you're arrested, um, the legal advice at the police station is totally free. Um, 
Um, the next bit, if you are charged and go to, to court, um, we come into the complex things of applying for legal aid. But don't worry too much about it because uh, some people will qualify for legal aid and our lawyers are so nice they will cover the people who can't because they will make money from those who can. So uh, it, yeah, you, you do not have a problem. One thing to quickly say on that is that sometimes in a police station the police will say that unless you use the duty solicitor or their telephone helpline that it, they will charge you. I can assure you now that none of the recommendations that you will be using will charge you for legal advice in the station, coming in for an interview or anything like that. So if they're saying that, they are talking um, yes. codswallow. <laughs> Could use some codswallow. Um, okay, the final question that we have had to it is about taking photos on the um, and I actually wonder if I could add a request for you guys to maybe take something like live streaming um, and, and posting photos <laughs> online, things to consider when doing that. But someone wondered um, if they were taking photos or video um, and they captured something illegal happening, do the police have any powers to confiscate their SD card or their camera? Yes, why? Yeah. As we were discussing with sound systems, I mean, the, the police have you know, very broad ranging powers to, to, to seize that, and that is something, a problem we have had before. I mean, more notably uh, with when people uh, post footage online and things like this, is that what is meant to, you know, people have good intentions. They, it's either maybe it's meant to capture what they perceive as a police, you know, misbehavior. And that actually what's happened is it's come and bit uh, people on the behind. Um, and live streaming in particular uh, is one because you don't, at that point, you're kind of relinquishing control over what you're showing and what you're not showing. And you could inadvertently end up building a wonderful prosecution case, which otherwise they wouldn't have been able to build without it. So we just, you know, say, be careful what you're filming. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah. Um, we've just had one last question. I think we'll probably make this the last question from the chat, but I will tell you how to get um, more questions answered in a moment, um, which is at the police station, do they take away all your belongings and how might someone go about keeping hold of a bus card? Probably a great time to talk about Sharpies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, um, so yeah, they do take your possessions away. I should have mentioned that. Um, when, they, when they search you, they'll take your, your possessions off you and they'll be put in a nice little plastic bag as evidence and they'll give you a your sheet with your list of it on just and then they'll offer you to sign it. You can choose whether you sign it or not um, of your possessions. Now the bus card, they often let you keep hold of the bus card, but it's not essential that you have one to get the lawyers, okay? You can either, one thing people do is they, they, they write numbers on their forearm and Sharpie is a good one. Um, any kind of pen that's not likely to get, you know, sweat or rain to remove it. Um, it's also worth putting the back office number also on the bus card on your arm so that if the, you know, so that you can point to the police and say, I want that lawyer and I want those, that number contacted. You don't even need that, to be honest. With the lawyers, you can just say, particularly with these central London police stations and the custody sergeants, you know, have Google. You know, if you say <laughs> that you want ITN solicitors, they will look up ITN solicitors and if they say oh I don't know it you know tell them that they can look it up all right make sure that you just you know if you are uncertain if you don't want to write it on yourself or if you're worried just remember one of them or two of them ITN, HAA, whichever really. Anything more? Okay um is there anything else that you guys want to add or should we do the, do the wrap up? No I'm fine. Good luck, everyone. Yeah. <laughs> hope, hope we don't see you um, in, in court yeah. afterwards, but pretty likely we might see some of you. Um, okay, um, I'm going to tilt this backwards. This is a very high tech planning technology. Um, so, for people that joined right at the start of the call, you got to see me do a little shout out for volunteers and also a bit of a signpost to where you can get um, further support and resources. So, I just wanted, um, if anyone missed that at the start, I just wanted to redo that. Um, I guess the first thing that I would say is if you joined this call late, um, you might have missed a really important bit that we did at the start, which was a beautiful rundown of five key things to remember when you're going on a protest. 
So um, especially if you joined after about the first sort of 15, 20 minutes, I would say please watch the replay link and please look at the um, Know Your Rights info on the Stop the Unfair website because you'll have missed something that you definitely want to remember. Um, yeah, watch the replay. Um, a, we realise we've given you a lot of information at once um, and it's probably a bit overwhelming to take it all in. You don't have to be a legal expert to be um, risk aware and safe on the, or um, as safe as you can be on the DICE site. And we will have legal observers on site. We will have some know your rights information sheets and we will also be doing daily know your rights um, briefings. And there'll be a few people who are quite experienced in protest law around. So um, there, there will be people um, and support and resources. Um, if you are someone who takes things in better by reading it than um, by hearing it, if you go to the Stop the Armsfair website, which is www.stopthearmsfair.org.uk, there's a whole Know Your Rights section on there, and that covers um, pretty much all the information that we covered in this call, plus it links out to a fantastic resource, which is the Green and Black Cross website, where you can read loads more about um, different um, laws that you might encounter, different um, things about police powers, just kind of everything that you might need to kind of skill yourself up to try and hold the police to account for their behaviour on site. Um, I'm going to do um, an extra shout out for some of the volunteer roles that I mentioned at the start. Um, so you're obviously all people that are concerned about um, trying to hold the police to account and um, trying to support people in um, accessing and upholding their rights on a protest. Um, if you are also someone who is a trained Green and Black Cross legal observer, and it's only the GBC training, not training by the groups um, really that we're able to work with for this, if you've been GBC trained and you might be able to volunteer your services as a legal observer for morning or afternoon shift during the week of action, we would really love to hear from you. Um, I will, when, I, when I've done the volunteer rundown, I'll give my email address so you can get in contact with me, but please do get in touch with us. Um, we're also looking for some people who are trained first aiders or trained mental health first aiders to support um, with the welfare tent. Again, if that's you and you can offer to do a morning or an afternoon shift during the week of action and the weekend of the big, um, the big protests, we would love to hear from you and um, please drop me a line. Um, I mentioned at the start, um, we mentioned halfway through the training, um, an appropriate adult scheme. That is um, sort of, um, I'm going to say enhanced police station support role, that makes it sound weirdly corporate. Um, it's, um, it's a special kind of police station support for um, people that have been arrested that are under 18. Um, in order to volunteer for that role, you need to have an in-date and up-to-date BBS check or CRB check. I'm afraid if it's um, out of date or it's lapsed um, for safeguarding reasons, um, we can't let you do that role, but you can do normal police station support um, for over 18s, which is another, again, another really, really important role because um, as you can hear, going through an arrest process is a bit of a rigmarole. The cops try and freak you out. It's like, it's a horrible environment to be in a police station. And a really important thing um, that often makes people feel really supported is having a friendly face in the, in the police station lobby waiting for them when they come out. So if you could be one of those friendly faces, um, please get in touch and volunteer to join the arrestee support um, rota. So if you want to do any of those roles, um, you can email me at, and my email address is cat at cat, and I'm going to spell that, which is kat at caat.org.uk. If you let me know that you could be one of those roles and you let me know roughly when in the week you might be available then I can loop you into the appropriate people to join the rotor. Um, what was the other thing I needed to say to you guys? Oh yeah, um, if you have specific, oh, oh um, before actually before I go into that, um, if you are an, an under 18 or you know some under 18s who are going to be coming to the site, a really important phone number for them to remember and for you to remember, so write this down um, as I say it out, is the appropriate adult phone and you can call the appropriate adult phone on 0736 7898714 so if you're um, an under 18 and you're arrested and you're at a police station phone phone them as your as your phone call and they'll arrange for someone on our appropriate adult team to come and support you at the station okay um, if you are sort of um, looking for a bit more specific legal advice, um, and again, because the law is like vague and not common sense in a lot of places, um, if you are thinking of something specific or you have a really specific set of circumstances that you want a bit more advice about what um, not holding citizenship might mean or something or something like that, um, 
please ring the protest support line and I'm going to give you the phone number for that and you can book a call back um, with someone who's relatively experienced who can discuss some hypothetical situations that you might be facing and again um, as with this call although it is um, you'll be speaking to someone trusted um, don't disclose sensitive details of anything that you might be planning like I'm face exactly what exactly who anything that could get you and them conspiracy charges or could blow your ability to draw plan. Um, so if you want to call that number and you want to get a bit of protest support, um, and again, this is a number that everyone might want to write down because it's going to be the protest support line for the whole of the week of action. Um, the number for that is 07946541511. Um, if you didn't have a pen or you can't remember any of those, um, or in fact you can't remember anything that we told you this evening, on the Dicey site, we will have loads of these bus cards and we will have legal observers. So there will be um, resources and people on site that can support you. But I think that's everything that I need to say. You guys are nodding, so you don't want to say anything else. Um, in that case, we will see you all on site. Um, and I will be, I'm hoping um, that I didn't mess up the technology and this is recorded. Um, so we will be sending you all um, a video recording of this webinar. So thanks guys. Oh, yeah, these guys are waiting too. <laughs> oh, and, and.